This is the Chris DeGall Show podcast. Okay, guys, let's just rip. And Chris DeGall. Chris DeGall. Chris, thanks for being with me tonight. Chris uh, DeGall. I'm joined now by Chris DeGall. Now. He puts the broad in broadband. It's Chris DeGaulle. The Chris DeGaulle Podcast is presented by USMedicalPlan.com. Save big money monthly and get better health coverage at USMedicalPlan.com. It's Monday, the 9th day of October, and I thank you so much for downloading the Chris DeGaulle Show Podcast. Coming up today, I tried to put together for you as best I could um, the sum total of events that have happened over the weekend in Israel. The attack on Israel, Israel's response, where things stand, uh, what does it mean to you and me strategically, uh, are there dangers here domestically, what are the dangers internationally. Uh, Kind of interestingly, um, a personal aside on this, uh, a a dear friend of mine and a church pastor named Dan Hepner and his wife Donna are actually touring Israel um, this week, and they've only been there a couple of days, and then this broke out. So I'd been texting with him a little bit. I asked him to come on the show today to give me his kind of personal, uh, as we recorded the conversation, we're seven hours behind. So this was kind of midday Israel time for him. And he gives us kind of his up-to-date perspective on what's going on. He's safe, but uh, getting found out Cory Booker, the senator from New Jersey, was there. He's already out of there. But there are Americans touring, not in any danger per se, but uh, can you imagine being there touring right now? They just want to come home. So we'll get his perspective. Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg, uh, the brilliant national security uh, advisor to Donald Trump, the Trump uh, administration. General Kellogg will be with us today. And um, so John Hayward, my great friend, who is also the uh, national security deputy editor at Breitbart, excuse me, Breitbart will be with us to give us his perspective. So, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm by no means am I... um, an expert on this particular subject. Uh, There's a long history that I include today at the Harumph Society. If you want to kind of go back and refresh or acquaint yourself for the first time with a brief summary and history of how Israel came to be and where things stand today. And uh, so there's just, there's a lot. And I mean, in its modern form, I mean, presently today, meaning the global, the UN, the whole, the kind of the history of the, the nation's states and how the whole thing came to pass in the current conflict. I don't mean biblical, of course. <laughs> that would be a heavy lift. But uh, I hope this show will give you uh, some perspective as we try to sort it out. I think it it helped me anyway. I will just say that. Let me tell you about John Ruhlman, a guy who also wants to help you save on health insurance costs. If you buy your own health insurance, I do not have to tell you how expensive that can be. So if you pay for premiums out of pocket, if you pay for your family, if you pay for yourself, particularly if you're a younger person. If you're not insured and you're younger, you're missing out on a huge opportunity to save um, great money. You're not going to be spending a lot, and if you need health insurance, heaven forbid, you get sick or in an accident or something, there are policies out there that cover you 100% and even pay you a salary while you're hospitalized. I mean, that's something you do have to think of. You hope you'll never have to use it, but Isn't it worth it for a few bucks a month to be covered like that? John will also evaluate your current health insurance for you and your family. If you buy it out of pocket, make sure it's the best coverage, that you are, in fact, fully covered. Uh, He's never going to charge you more. Like, John's goal is never to make things more expensive or get you into a more expensive plan. It's always to get you into better insurance for less. And he works with 80 different insurers to get it done. If you're a small business person, you insure, pay for the insurance of your employees. Let John shop and compare products and plans for you too. I'm telling you, the guy's a genius. He's helped personal friends of mine save thousands of dollars a month. 877-410-4321. 877-410-4321 or usmedicalplan.com. Now, there is a healthy amount of arguing that this had nothing to do with it. Iran, while behind this, and it's no doubt about it, there seems to be this healthy debate that the $6 billion we just gave them had anything to do with it. Even Liz Cheney tweeted yesterday, money is fungible and it moves about. And yes, it did. And anybody that would suggest otherwise is a fool. Jennifer Griffin over at Fox, for some reason, eager to run cover for the Biden administration, pumping $6 billion to Iran. 
whittle it away at a far more rapid pace than anyone thought possible. So here we go again. I've been reading a number of others have been talking to the six billion dollars in frozen funds that was unfrozen, uh, you, you know, to, in, in order to, to sort of get hostages out and then get a better relations, maybe return to an accord. But this is coming up again and again, and that Iran has played a role here. And maybe some of this money was playing a role here. What are you hearing? Well, I think, first of all, Neil, I think you have to push back on some of the statements in that that statement oh, um, sure, from sure. former President Trump. Um, I, it is an exaggeration to suggest that that um, there is any evidence that that any of the money that was released as part of that hostage um, deal, um, that a lot of that money was tied up in, uh, you know, um, in goods. Um, what I would say is that Iran has been funding Hamas across four presidents. <laughs> and so you, you, it goes yeah. back, uh, through the entire, when I was based there again back in, in, from 1999 to 2007, is, uh, Iran was funding Hamas. Uh, that uh-huh. has not slowed or changed over the years. And it's not one administration or the next who has, um, who has been able to to stem the flow of that money to Hamas. What is different is the fact that well, usually Israel has enough intelligence and and um, accurate uh, predictions, and they carry out a lot of strikes in the Gaza Strip to, to right. um, destroy factories and the, where these rockets are being made. But um, but I think we right now the focus should be on supporting... All right, um, Jennifer, thank you. We have some breaking news with... <laughs> So if you followed that uh, State Department shill, Jennifer Jennifer Griffin, Antony Blinken's lapdog, if you followed that, hey, Neil, it's unfair to say this $6 billion went to Iran because we've been funding Iran for decades. Hello? Is this, did I hear that? Did I hit my head? We've been funding Iran for decades. And by the way, really, you know, Neil, neither here nor there how they got this money or whether or they got the money. Let's, let's, uh, let's just tell the truth here and talk about what the real issue is. Israel's intelligence needs to be 100% right at all times. And if they ever get it wrong, even one time, well, isn't Israel really to blame? Shouldn't they have had better intelligence? I've heard this a lot, incidentally. Shouldn't Israel have had better intelligence I, I, if I heard that once, I heard it a thousand times this weekend. You know, Israel really dropped the ball here. They really have a stronger, stouter intelligence than this. Um, have, have we never been sucker punched? For God's sakes, folks, we just had a spy balloon fly through our airspace last year for eight days, and we didn't do anything about it. That's a balloon. We had an, we had an F-35 a guy ejects out of, and it takes off for I don't know how long. We didn't even know where it went. Our southern border is wide the hell open. Then you hit rewind and go all the way back to 9-11, in which Rumsfeld famously was quoted as saying it was a failure of our imaginations or some such thing. So it's Israel's fault that they didn't see this coming, is the official State Department narrative from Jennifer Griffin. That's fantastic. And you really, you know, it would be unfair. You know, it's just it's absurd to say the $6 billion went to Iran. I mean, I've been covering the White House for a long time, and, uh, you know, we've been giving money to Iran for a long time. So it's not just the $6 billion, Neil. Okay, well, now that's a different editorial comment, Jennifer. You, What you just actually did was confirm that, yes, in fact, the free flow of dollars from American presidents has long existed. And that just exacerbated it. You didn't rebut the question. Trump cut off funds to Palestinians. That is what's true. Trump launched unprecedented peace initiatives in what was called the Abraham Accords. That's what's true. Donald Trump killed an Iran deal that funneled gazillions of dollars to them, pallets of cash from Barack Obama personally. Donald Trump was starving the Iranian regime of resources. He crushed the sanctions with Iran. And Biden reversed it all. They've undermined Netanyahu at every turn. 
I remind you that we are in the third term of Barack Obama. And Barack Obama hates Israel. The Democrat Party hates Israel. And as long as Barack Obama is running Washington, D.C., and he is, I believe in my heart of hearts, I know I can't literally um, prove this, but you get a sense of a guy after a while. I believe Barack Obama is an anti-Semite. He has always been anti-Israel. He has always been disrespectful to Benjamin Netanyahu. You remember Barack Obama once said the most beautiful sound he ever heard was the Muslim call to prayer? Remember when he said that? He did. Check it. Yes, he did. The most beautiful sound he'd ever heard in the world. Just as an aside. Barack Obama and Biden refuse to meet with Netanyahu. They demand Israel make more concessions. We've hopped back in bed with Netanyahu, or with the, the Palestinians, rather. Reading some of the uh, commentary from Twitter, early headlines have downplayed the severity and nature of this attack. The coverage all day on Saturday over on uh, MSNBC, for instance, was ignorant and deplorable, trying to excuse the actions of the terrorists, writes one. Similarly, the New York Times published an article on the same day suggesting Gaza suffering from the Israeli blockade was the problem. You read a lot of blaming Israel over the weekend, didn't you? I kind of, I shudder, frankly, at the anti-Semitism that effervesces to the surface when things like this happen. You begin to read amongst your fellow Americans, you begin to read in much of the mainstream media just how anti-Semitic so many of them are, really. And even members of Congress, actually, the Democrat Party, it's chilling. The coverage and reactions are inevitably pushing on Israel to accept a more muted response to all of this. Of course, Netanyahu wasting no time and said, we're going to war. You're not doing this to us. We're not screwing around. Saddle up. It's wartime. And this isn't going to be a couple of days. We're going to make this hurt. You just effed around and now you're going to find out. And good for Israel. I hope it's devastating, as a matter of fact. And it looks like it's on pace to be. This is a full war now. And Israel has to do whatever it takes to win decisively. And at a minimum, that means an end to Hamas as the governing entity in Gaza. This is a Biden administration with a lot to answer for. Their entire approach has been a failure. I think a purposeful one. Restarting aid to Gaza without any conditions, continually enabling Iran. They've downplayed and ignored the scandal of their administration being compromised by an Iranian influence operation that connects back to the Iranian government the Iran hostage deal negotiated by Qatar, which is where the Hamas leadership lives in luxury while planning terrorist attacks against civilians. Here's some of the Secretary of State over the weekend. Well, that obviously has changed dramatically, not just for Jake Sullivan, but for all of you. And this isn't... A specifically about anything that Jake missed, but more broadly about the intelligence failure, not just by the Israelis, but the U.S. What can you say about that? Well, for two things, Donna. First, what Jake Sullivan said was right. If you look at uh, the relationship among countries in the Middle East, um, you saw uh, with a lot of work by the United States, countries coming together, the region integrating. Yeah. Um, hostilities. Real diminishing. healers. And we've been very engaged in pursuing, for example, normalization between Israel and its neighbors, uh, building on what's already been done, mm -hmm. uh, including with uh, Saudi Arabia and other conflicts like uh, the conflict in Yemen, where we've had a truce now for uh, almost two years, uh, have made a huge difference. Huge difference. Right. Colonel Kurt Schlichter said American steps that ought to be taken right now. Give Israel whatever it asks for to kill terrorists, including arms and access to American intelligence. Expel every Palestinian passport holder in the United States. Give them 48 hours to get the hell out. 
end every cent of aid to any Palestinian organization and institution and stop giving Iran money. Benjamin Netanyahu tells Gaza residents to get out. He vows to use all capabilities to destroy Hamas. Quote, we will win this war, but the price will be unbelievably heavy. Hamas wants to murder us all. Our friend Joel Pollack at Breitbart said, I have broken the Sabbath and Jewish holiday to deliver this message. Israel should wipe out Gaza, allow 48 hours to evacuate women, children, and the elderly, destroy everything that remains, plow it under, and annex it to Israel. This is the end for Hamas and Palestinian terror. On the uh, campaign trail, former Vice President Mike Pence. Let me begin at where, where we ought to start. I mean, that disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan has emboldened the enemies of freedom around the world. And now war is raging uh, in Eastern Europe. And, and President Joe Biden's kowtowing for the last two and a half years to the mullahs in Iran, lifting sanctions, begging them to get back in the Iran nuclear deal, and then uh, paying $6 billion in a ransom uh, for hostages, I, I think set the conditions uh, for this unprecedented terrorist attack uh, by Hamas against Israel. But I also believe this is what happens when we have leading voices like Donald Trump, Vivek Ramswamy, and Ron DeSantis signaling retreat from America's role as leader of the free world. Ah, uh, look, uh, there it the, is. What happened and that'll in do. Was an... From the pro-war wing of the Republican Party, always taking the opportunity to now make it about Ukraine. And we come right back to Ukraine. Can you believe this? In the midst of this, you have Republicans like Lindsey Graham and Mike Pence. Did you hear now that there are Republicans that say we should just go ahead and fund Ukraine through the election just so we don't have to worry about the Ukrainian effort losing uh, running out of money before our next presidential election? I'm not kidding. That's a new proposal on the, on the table from people like Lindsey Graham. They're making an equivalent to Hamas and Russia. And that Israel is Ukraine. <laughs> Ron DeSantis on the attacks. Israel is now under attack. I stand with Israel. America stands with Israel. Not only do they have a right to defend themselves, they have a duty to defend themselves against these Iranian-backed Hamas terrorists. Iran has helped fund this war against Israel and Joe Biden's policies that have gone easy on Iran has helped to fill their coffers. Israel is now paying the price for those policies. We're going to stand with the state of Israel. They need to root out Hamas uh, and we need to stand up to Iran. As for the husk, the guy we're pretending is actually president. He spoke for not quite a grand total of three full minutes in the last 48 hours publicly on this. Here's the sum total of it. I got up this morning and started this at 7.30, 8 o'clock, my calls. Mosque terrorists crossing in Israel, killing not only Israeli soldiers, but Israeli civilians. Thank you very much. Mr. President, was there uh, an intelligence failure in the lead-up to this attack? Mr. President, can you tell us what the asked you specifically for support? Right. And he shuffles out of the room. Peter Ducey reporting on the barbecue. President Biden had nothing to say about this on camera today. We did hear some music throughout the afternoon and the early evening coming from the south side of the White House, the area of the Rose Garden or the portico over there. And we are told that the president and the first lady were hosting a barbecue for executive residence staff. Yeah. Back to you. You know, <laughs> the original tweet from the White House was, quote, we urge all sides to refrain from violence and retaliatory attacks. Did you know that? That got caught and was taken down swiftly. But that was the first initial White House response. Screen grab, by the way, so not making it up. You can go check it for yourself. 
Israel is the moral equivalent of terrorists executing civilians and brutalizing their corpses, apparently, to the Biden administration. That is their initial knee-jerk reaction. It's been my pleasure and honor to talk about Bob Spinato at Williamsburg Dental in Broomall, just off the Blue Route, as my dentist and friend of over 12 years now. But now he has two brand new associates, his daughter Alexa and Dr. Geddes. Tell them about him, Bob. Yeah, it's really a thrill for me to have both the dentists, my daughter and Dr. Jared Geddes. One of the things that I love about them both is they, when they don't have a patient in their chair, they're in my room watching what I do and trying to learn from me. And we hear enough about the new generation and they think they know everything and they don't want to work. And I've got two dentists who are really, really want to learn and really, really willing to work, uh, to work hard. And I enjoy learning from them. They brought some new skills and some new technologies to our office. Um, that will be great benefits to our patients. And so if anything, I think that uh, having them both there is going to um, expand my and, and lengthen my career as opposed to shorten my career. Pick up the phone or go online, make that appointment, 610-353-2700 or williamsburg-dental.com. It's uh, midday in Israel. And a dear friend of mine, Pastor Dan Hepner of Glenmore United Methodist Church out there in Chester County, Pennsylvania, happens to be on a trip with his wife and friends uh, and they're on the ground in Israel this morning, uh, this morning, our time, afternoon, his time. And Pastor, I am grateful for your perspective and time this morning. I wanted to check in with you briefly. First of all, how are you and uh, your fellow travelers? Good morning. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. <clears throat> we are fine. We are um, right now in a hotel in Jerusalem. Uh, it is safe here. It's a holy city and everyone is fine. It's good to hear. What what did you hear this weekend as things were unfolding, and how far away are you from the conflict, your tour group, roughly? Well, at the time we heard um, through um, our travel guide, who is uh, an Arab Christian, well-connected with the government. You have to excuse my voice. It's so dry out here. <clears throat> I'll clear it. Um, we were miles 60 miles away from the conflict. We've since moved. Um, we're in Jerusalem now, but as I said, we're about 35 miles from the Tel Aviv airport, but uh, rather safe. So it was um, unnerving. And, uh, you know, there's only 15 of us, but uh, it was unnerving. What, what do they, I mean, forgive my kind of ignorance with this whole, whole thing. I don't, I mean, obviously it's not the entirety of the nation. It's a region where this conflict is happening, but, um, you know, we, we heard some awful things coming out of Egypt. Are, are you being told as tourists to be on some kind of heightened alert? It seems the state department, at least out of Egypt has suggested that tourists now need to behave with more caution than maybe they had been. That's, that's true. Although things are, uh, tour groups are still moving here in Jerusalem. Um, uh, a little uh, less so. Uh, there's a lot of things that are closed here in Jerusalem right now. We just took a tour um, of uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, and we were uh, there's troops um, on the corners. There's uh, Israeli forces on the corners uh, patrolling. There's uh, local police out. It's uh, um, it's somewhat of a tense time right now, but most of the action is is again down south. It is the sense of it, Pastor Hepner, that this is. Gaza, and it is related exclusively to that region. When these things happen in Israel, um, it's traditionally over that s strip of land and in that region of the nation. It's not. It's not the whole. I mean, obviously, you know, when we're here and we get the news, you hear Israel. It's not the entire nation on fire at war per se. I mean, the nation declared war, but it's not. The entire country is not full of unrest. Is the point? No, not at all. Not at all. It's it's generally in that area. And um, our tour guide has uh, walked us through the specifics of the history of these conflicts. Um, this one happens to be much worse than most, but uh, there's ab absolutely bubbling history down there of conflict. What should we know as Americans watching this or what have you learned as an American touring there? I don't know if you've taken this trip before. But uh, what 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 are your impressions? What are your takeaways? What would you have us know? Well, uh, it's uh, Donna's and my first tour. Um, we've never been to the Middle East. Um, several people in our group have been here before. This is a beautiful land. It's a 
uh, a, a, it's it's a land that um, <laughs> I mean I have uh, Chris and we're together. I I've got so many pictures and things to show you, but um, it is just a magical place and um, absolutely breathtakingly beautiful um, with some strife and uh, and some challenge. Our, our trip happened to have been very physical. I mean, it started in 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 Egypt and moved on uh, we went to the pyramids and I, what i mean by physical there's a lot it's a lot of walking a lot of climbing um it's a you know it's not for the faint of heart to be over here these are these are landmarks these are places where you have to walk to and um but it, it's quite magical and for, as for christians um it, it's 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 ground zero is your tour ongoing then, as had been planned? And do you have any do you anticipate in any way that you would have trouble leaving when it's time to go home, come home? Well, we are having uh, some difficulties. Our airline um, has canceled flights um, yesterday, today, and we're finding out now tomorrow. Uh, we have a flight out um, on Wednesday. And because it's such a resourceful group that we have, we now have our United States Congresswoman involved um, in our departure and our safe landing in the United States, um, along with uh, the State Department that we have also um, uh, communicated with um, on a lesser extent. Um, but there's a lot of people on the ground um, in Chester County that are working on our behalf to get us home. So you won't be, you might understand, then you won't be flying out in the traditional commercial way then? Um, as of now, we will be. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Our flight has not been canceled for Wednesday, and um, our flight takes us from uh, Ben Gurion Airport to Munich and then on to Newark, New Jersey. Uh, so right now we have been told that uh, through the airline <clears throat> that the flight is still um, ready for departure, and uh, we're ready to go. <laughs> we're wow. very ready to I, go. I bet you are. Do you uh, is that is that your ten. is that your sense of it now, Pastor? You just want to go, or is there more? Was there more to see, or more there is, there, there is to be seen that you'd like to see, or is your sense just get me out of here now? Oh, we want to go. Yeah, we want we want to go, and we've let everyone know that is helping us in the United States that we want to go. Okay. Glad you're safe. My love to Donna and uh, Pastor, we love you. And uh, keep us, if, if there's anything we can do to be helpful, it sounds, it sounds like things are under control and calm and safe, and I'm grateful. That's, that's a blessing. But uh, please keep us posted if there's anything more we can do to be helpful, sir. Thanks so much, Chris. God bless you. That's Pastor Dan Hepner, uh, Glenmore United Methodist Church in uh, Glenmore, Pennsylvania, Chester County. I turn now to my uh, dear friend John Hayward, National Security Deputy Editor at Breitbart. He's Doc underscore zero on Twitter. John, there's obviously, I mean, the history here is decades and decades old. Um, for people who don't understand this, I, it, it almost warrants a history lesson to, to fully understand it all. But in that we don't have time for that, uh, I welcome you in. And I guess if you could just kind of give us, as you do so well, the 30,000 foot view of what we're witnessing here over the weekend. Well, the most important part of that history, people should know that they're not hearing a lot from the media, is that the Israelis withdrew from Gaza in 2005. They don't have settlers there. They're not occupying anything. That's all mythology that the Palestinians have created with the help of compliant Western media. And today, over the weekend, you saw a lot of news organizations looking very, very, very uncomfortable with being reminded this. They, they all started muttering and shutting up when people started pointing out there aren't any Israelis in the Gaza. What are you talking about? There's no occupiers. You know, this is nonsense. But it, it's a, a line of mythology that the, the Western media has swallowed hook, line, and thinker from the Palestinians. And now, as, as we see this attack unfolding, this is not just Hamas. I mean, this was Hamas using Gaza as a base to attack Israel as part of a war orchestrated by Iran. There's really no doubt of it. I don't think the Israelis will do anything to Iran until they have rock-solid proof, because they know how the rules work for them. They know that they're going to get savaged if they do anything uh, based on hearsay or anything less than the highest standard of evidence. So they'll have a smoking gun before they make a move, but they will find the smoking gun. There are Hamas guys all weekend bragging that Iran helped them do this and trained them and coordinated them and gave them logistical support. There was a Hamas operative who bragged to Reuters over the weekend about how they fooled the Israelis by pretending to care about their people. 
That is literally what he said. He said, this is how we fooled Israel. We, we, we pretended we cared about the people of Gaza. We pretended we were helping them, and we were focused on community works, and that's all we wanted, and that lulled the Israelis into a false sense of security. And meanwhile, Iran was helping us train our troops, and then we, then we struck, and we, and we took them out by surprise. And they're, they're proud of this. This is their brilliant strategy for attacking. So, I mean, that is the enemy that Israel is up against right now. John, the, uh, there are two things that I heard a lot over the weekend. One was, and I just want to take them in order, I guess, one was that Israel really should have been better prepared for this, and this was a massive failing of their intelligence. And I just thought to myself, so they've got to get it 100% right every time, all the time, or risk death by hundreds and hundreds, at least. Yeah, that's been the game that they've been playing all along, and any Israeli intelligence source will tell you that, that that's, they know those are the rules. They can never be wrong. They can never let their guard down. And it is amazing that they were taken this completely by surprise. There is going to be years of inquests into this, just as we had years of security reviews after 9-11. And they're going to be asking, how did this happen? How could you have allowed this to happen? How are you blind to this? And we have part of the answer from Hamas telling us how they fooled them by pretending to actually give a damn about the Palestinian people. You know, and the Israelis were busy. They had a big political battle going on over there. It's been in progress for some time over judicial reforms. So very divisive political struggle, and the Israelis were busy with that. So that they were lulled into a, into a position of weakness here. And the one thing we don't know yet is how the Mossad and the Israeli intelligence services seem so completely blind to this being a real threat. Other thing I heard was it is absurd, absurd. Jennifer Griffin went on Fox News and uh, many people, absurd, it's absurd to suggest this $6 billion we just sent to Iran had anything to do with this. Absurd, 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 John. Well, it's, it's very on brand for the Biden administration to not know how money works. I mean, that's what they're basically saying. They're saying our whole administration are full of slack jawed imbeciles and none of us understands how money works. We don't understand that if you give somebody six billion dollars for whatever reason, that gives them six billion dollars to spend on whatever they want. They, they just sit there. They look like deer in the headlights blinking real slow when people start uh, confronting them with this. But, yeah, I mean, the rest of us know how money works. The Biden administration is comprehensively useless in this as in all other things. But the rest of us should understand. Yeah, you promise somebody they're about to get six billion dollars. They've got a lot of money to spend on whatever they want now. And remember, this thing about the six billion hostage payout, that didn't just happen. We didn't find out about it until months after the deal was sealed. But the deal was sealed after months of negotiation before that. That. So Iran has known for the better part of a year, at least, that Biden was going to put $6 billion in their pocket. And that gave them a lot of money to work on this with. Surprise you that Barack Obama, and again, I haven't checked this. I should, but I'm not really interested anymore. At least a full 24 hours after the fact, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, nothing, not a word. The former secretary of state and president, nothing to say about this. Does that, should that surprise us? No, <laughs> that, I think that's <laughs> wise of them. If, if I were Barack Obama, I'd be running for the hills right now. He, he's as responsible for this as any other person in the world with his empowering of Iran. His, this is his strategy. This is him. Joe Biden's a husk. He's a shambling wreck. If you saw this, this speech that he gave yesterday, two minutes, he talks about this, and then he walks away and turns his back on the human race, and he goes and calls an early day and has a barbecue. Joe Biden doesn't know where he is half the time. He didn't do this. Barack Obama did this. This is Barack Obama's strategy. This is his people. This is his third term. This was his big foreign policy innovation was pivoting to Iran. And he's as responsible for setting the stage for this as anybody else in the world. Netanyahu, John Hayward, says that uh, this is going to like this is war. We're not screwing around. And um, by all accounts, when he says that, he means it like we're talking about a full blown, full scale leveling. I hear many people. I'm reading many people say now you eliminate, you exterminate Hamas and you level everything in its path. You don't screw around, no half yeah. measures. Um, number one, are they capable? As I understand it, Israel is more than capable. As you said, they've got to be really serious about knowing for sure uh, Iran's involvement before they act. But is Israel capable of uh, taking all of these entities on and, and getting this aggressive if necessary? Well, they are, but it's going to be extremely ugly. We've seen this before. They've, they've had to invade Gaza during past terrorist attacks. We know how brutal it is. And on those occasions, they weren't nearly as motivated or as tall in order as they have today. You know, So we know how hard it is to go in there on the ground and fight house to house in Gaza. And the, the Palestinians and the Iranians, their terror masters, they're doubtless counting on this. This is how they're going to get Israel. They're going to make sure that they have footage of everything the Israelis do in Gaza that they can broadcast to the world, and they'll start shrieking that we're poor 
helpless victims. And, you know, it's going to work with some people. You might think that sounds insane after what they just did. But, uh, you know, look at the squad over here. Look at the uh, look at the uh, the Hamas chorus in the Democratic Party. They'll fall for that. Absolutely. They'll fall for that. <laughs> as soon as the Palestinians start broadcasting pictures of, uh, you know, Israelis blowing up a building or something to get Hamas leaders and they'll start shrieking the 52,000 children died in that attack. And, you know, Rash- Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, they'll believe that in a hot second. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. <laughs> yeah, they, they know perfectly well how to play this game. They do have a strategy here. And in fact, many of our major cities yesterday, you saw it in Philadelphia, you saw it in New York, uh, groups of people chanting through the streets, pro-Palestinian, anti-Israeli chants and marches, John, right here domestically. And, you know, even beyond that, that's horrifying to look at. But look at how many people in the foreign policy community, in the Biden administration, high players in the Democratic Party and overseas in in other countries. Look at how many of them, their immediate first response was to say to Israel, don't do anything. Uh, Back off. Let's deescalate. Let's have some peace here. Uh, Let's everybody back away. Violence solves nothing. Uh, Gretchen Whitmer, you know, is is under pressure to resign after the statement that she made as an example. That, you know, that is so monstrous to me that this savage attack of unpopularity paralleled barbarity, one of the worst things we've seen, you know, in the history of human depravity. And that's these people's first response. Hey, back down. Don't do anything. Uh, don't hurt anybody. Let's increase the peace here. Well, maybe let's give the Palestinians some concessions and uh, we'll see if that calms them down a little bit. That, that, that's terrifying. But on, on the subject of the, the demonstrations in New York and stuff, remember back after 9-11 when the Palestinians were dancing in the streets and handing out candy after the 9-11 attack mm-hmm. and our media decided we couldn't see that? They suppressed those images because they thought us knuckled dragging deplorables, wouldn't be able to handle it if we could see that. that, that that's who the Palestinians are. We've known this for a long time, and we were just prevented from seeing it when they were at their worst. The total non sequitur here is from the Republican groups that are now jumping up and down. You see, you see, this is why we have to endlessly fund Ukraine. That was literally something else that was drawn as a parallel this weekend that I cannot, for the life of me, figure out how you get there. That's that's a dicey argument to make. And on top of who should get the funding, how much funding is there? I mean, the, the big the big debate in Congress over the last couple of weeks was that we're out of money. We don't have any more money or material to send Ukraine. There's not much oversight for this money. We don't know where it's all going, and and we're going completely bankrupt. We're we're sacrificing our domestic priorities to pour billions into Ukraine. I happen to want Ukraine to win that war, and I don't like Russia invading them. And I'm all in favor of supporting them. But we have to be realistic about what we can do. And now comes this. You know, here's another demand on our resources and this could escalate if, if or Israel attacks Iran, if this spirals into a regional war, we're already moving a carrier group into that area. So this could escalate. We could easily become involved in it and do we have the resources? Do we have the manpower? Our military has been gutted by political correctness. Is it ready to fight a war like that? John, what's the significance of the timing of this attack? Is there? I, I read some kind of historical um, like relationship perhaps or, or no? Is that how you read it? There is a, there's a component of Iranian doomsday mythology and their version of, of Islam that talks about how certain signs will be present for the end of the world and the return of the prophet. And that this all fits into that. So there, there could be a religious component in Iran behind them being willing to do this. There's an obvious tactical advantage to attacking Israel on a major holiday at a time when they didn't think any kind of an attack was going to come. And in geopolitics, I mean, there, there's two words here, Joe Biden. How do you not take advantage of Joe Biden being there? He's not going to be there much longer. He may not even be in office until the end of his term if his health keeps deteriorating. But for right now, you have the weakest, most incompetent president in the history of of the world here in in American history. And you've seen how he reacts to pressure. You saw what he did in Afghanistan. You saw what happens when a crisis blows up. You saw how inept his whole administration is. You've seen Anthony Blinken. I think that one of the things that motivated this attack is not just knowing that Joe Biden is senile and they can walk all over him. They're looking at Anthony Blinken, the secretary of state, and how easily fooled he is and how incompetent he is and how he always looks shocked when anything happens and he just stands there flapping his gums and waving his arms and has no idea what to do. How do you not take advantage of that? Elon Musk buying Twitter. I, I mean, that the coverage of this war, I think, is going to play out on Twitter. Nothing censored there, thank God. I mean, that may be the only unobjectionable place to get a real flow of information, to be truthful. 
And does, has it already changed the trajectory of this? We have seen so many horrible images. I'm sure a lot of people in the audience have seen this. It is going all over Twitter. They're showing these clips. Hamas is uploading some of them because they're bragging about their barbaric achievements. But over the weekend, a lot of people got a chance to see what they're actually doing. And there is power in images. There is power in actually seeing it, not just hearing about it, not just reading about it, but actually seeing it. And I think that's already changing the trajectory of this. Because again, remember 9-11. There's so much they didn't show us. There were images of the attack of people jumping out of the flaming buildings that the media decided we didn't need to see because they thought it would color our response to the situation. And this time, they don't control the flow of information anymore. I could think of nobody I wanted to uh, start the show off with than you, John Hayward. Thank you so much for your brilliance today. My Pillow 2.0. I don't know if you are familiar with the product yet. I don't know if you've seen Mike Lindell talking about My Pillow 2.0, but I'm sleeping on it right now. And I can tell you, this is amazing. He's developed a pillow that actually keeps you cool at night. Sincerely, I didn't even know that was possible. If you're somebody that runs a little warm at night, Mike has actually created a MyPillow 2.0, which is that adjustable fill that he's talked about for the last 20 years, but now a new fabric that helps regulate your body temperature through the night, which creates a lower surface temperature, and that gets you a better restful night's sleep. Now, here's the thing. If you go to MyPillow.com and you order the new MyPillow 2.0 today, you'll get another one for free just by using my name, Chris. So go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio listener square, and enter my name, Chris, and you will get a second MyPillow 2.0 for free. My name also gets you up to 66% on everything on that website, 66% off. Robes, slippers, sheets, dog beds, my coffee. Mike has an unbelievable uh, spate of merchandise on, at MyPillow.com, more than I had any idea. So if you haven't shopped MyPillow yet, I hope you'll go. I hope you'll name use my name, Chris, and save big-time money on great products, which are all American-made. They are warranted for 10 years. There's a 60-day money-back guarantee. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call 800-932-5056, 800-932-5056, or MyPillow.com. The Wall Street Journal reporting that Hamas says they've been working with Iran for six months. The Wall Street Journal reports that. Hamas has been bragging about Iran helping them for the last six months carry out this attack over the weekend. Uh, as for Israel, they say they have now retaken control of Gaza Strip border areas. Over 800 people dead, as of news reports this morning. The State Department reports nine Americans have been killed in Israel thus far. Um, Hezbollah says Palestine is not Ukraine, and if the U.S. intervenes directly, all U.S. positions in the region will become legitimate targets. Then there's the matter of X, formerly Twitter, and there are a whole lot of people there saying a whole lot of stuff that's Really incendiary, really inflammatory, can induce panic. I don't like inducing panic. I'm no source. I don't have sources. I try to go to sources. People that know what they're talking about, smart people, like uh, a longtime friend of this show, and I was so grateful he could make time for us today, Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg, former National Security Advisor to the Trump administration. Uh, General, the first thing I want to ask you this morning, and thank you for coming on uh, during this busy breaking news day, is... Um, People that are suggesting now that Americans should be concerned ab about militant action, terrorist acts, maybe even here domestically, what can you speak to about that, if at all, or internationally? Good morning. Yeah, Chris, good morning. Thanks for having me. Well, I think you always have to be aware of it. I think the probability and the potential of that happening is, is always large in a nation like ours, uh, which is open, and you know, we've got clearly open borders in the South. And who, who knows who's come through those borders as well. But I think this is one of those you can't, you know, Chris, to me, you can uh, never operate from fear. What I mean by operate from fear, you, have, you can never be afraid of somebody saying, well, they're going to do something. It's sort of like my attitude has always been bring it on. Yeah. If you want to do that, fine. We're going to respond accordingly. And we'll, you will pay a disproportionate price if you do something stupid like that. And I think you have to say, OK, the, problem, the potential of this is, is high. It's sort of like when you, when you look at senior officials, you kind of say, look, whether you like it or not, they're pretty vulnerable. You know, the, even you can take the best protections you've got. 
but we're so open. It's a target-rich environment for, for terrorists. But you have to make sure that they would pay a price. And, and what you do is you create a, a mindset in your adversary, your enemy, that you, they don't want to have to pay the price of doing something stupid. And you go, look, let me just use one quick example. Years ago, when, when we went after Soleimani, the Iranian Quds leader, the general involved, we told the supreme leader of Iran, you're next. And we meant it. And, and I tell people, look, what you have to understand is this, the consequence of that, what happened after that. And 99% of Americans don't realize it. Three days after we killed Soleimani, and we had told the Supreme Leader of Iran, you're next if something happens to Americans. In, in Tehran, they shot down a Ukrainian airliner coming out of Tehran International Airport because they thought it was us coming out of the Supreme Leader. That's respect and that's fear. And that's what you have to do. So at the end, you know, I'll, I'll circle back and say, look, you, you almost have to say, okay, we are a large country. That could happen here. But whoever does it will pay a disproportionate price, and you don't want to go there. And most of the time what happens is the other the adversary backs off. They say, you know, I'm going to go somewhere else for breakfast today, not here. Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg with us. Um, you served as former National Security Advisor in the Trump administration. We, we know uh, Trump's resume here, uh, the Abraham Accords. We, we, we know there was, I mean, there was just no meaningful conflict on this scale during the tenure of the Trump administration. Uh, clearly, I I Iran knew its place. Clearly, Hamas and Hezbollah knew their place. They didn't try it on his watch, on your watch. Um, what's different? Well, what's different is, is the attitude of this administration. This is going back to the old Obama administration, which you're basically trying to normalize relations with Iran. That's what this administration is trying to do. That's what the Obama administration did. You're not going to normalize relations with Iran. They're a terrorist state. The fact this is a think of it this way: their what their parliament chanted just this just a couple of days ago, "Death to America, death to Israel." Can you imagine if our Congress was saying something like that? <laughs> that's what you have to think like. This is a government that's a terrorist government. You have to you know understand that. So trying to normalize relations with them is is beyond foolish. So what happens is they say, oh, see, America is trying to normalize. They're not going to respond forcefully to what we're doing. That goes back to the leadership and the respect and the fear and the concern that you put in the eyes of an adversary. So what's happened because of us giving them all of that money, the $6 billion. But here's what's worse, Chris, is that people need to look back at their revenue, their oil revenue. This year, they're going to take in about $45 billion of oil revenue. When we were the last year of our administration, Trump administration, they gained $8 billion. Look at the, the huge increase in money that they're getting. And where do you think that money's going? It's going a lot of that to the Quds Force, which is their external force. They're the, that's the one that creates problems with Hezbollah and Hamas as well. And, and you can't normalize with these. And that's what we realized. We told everybody you can't do it. And when you look at what's happened in the Middle East right now, which is also concerning is, is Saudi Arabia and Iran, they broke their deal. And who brokered it? China. That would have never happened on our watch. Never. We would have made sure they were separated. There was no, there was no normalization. And that's what's caused part of the problem with the Abraham Accords, because what we were doing, we were normalizing relations with the Arab states. We, had, we thought we had Saudi almost under control. In the sense, under control, they were going to normalize relations with Israel, and it would have quieted the whole region. But what's happened is this administration didn't do it. And now you've got China involved, you've got Iran involved, you've got everybody involved, and it's just back to a huge mess. This goes back to the Obama-Biden days of pre-Trump, and, and we're living with the consequences, and the consequences are not going to be good. Look what happened in Israel just a couple of days ago when they talk about 700 dead or 800 dead. The equivalence, when you look at a population density, that's like 20,000 Americans dying. Think about that. This is a massive attack, and this happened external to Israel. I mean, external to, to Gaza. Israel hasn't been in Gaza since 2005. So this is the force that went across the border, attacked settlements inside Israel. This was an offensive move by Hamas, and they're going to have to pay a price for it. Do you have any reason to doubt reports that uh, su suggest Iran was closely working with um, Hamas on this attack for maybe months? Do you doubt that story, or is that highly probable in your mind? No, it's, I, I, there's no doubt in my mind. They, they do, this was an attack that was premeditated. 
pre-plan. Of course they did that. Of course they provided the weapon systems. Of course they supported it through planning. This was just not a random attack. That's the reason I made a comment that this was an attack external to Gaza. They went offensively into Israel and attacked these settlements. They had to do that through planning. When you see what they've done with, with the hang gliders and the use of the vehicles, it was a coordinated attack. Hamas isn't that good militarily to do that. Of course they had external support. And the only nation that could have done that is, is Iran. Nobody else in the region could do that. And that's the reason you also have to look to the north and the concern you've got to have with Hezbollah to the north coming out of Lebanon, supported by Iran. So this is one of those – this goes back to our relationships with Iran. They say, well, they can get away with it now because the, this, the United States is trying to normalize relations. Look what just happened with Rob Malloy when one of our negotiators with Iran has lost his security clearance because he was actually in bed with him. I mean, this is incredible to me when you see what's happening. And people just have to sit back and, and kind of compartmentalize. What I mean by compartmentalize is really focus in on it. Don't let the extraneous stuff bleed into what you're thinking about. Focus really hard on it, and it'll become very, very clear. When you hear Republicans... <laughs> Like Lindsey Graham talking about how uh, now is the time we must fund things like Ukraine through next year. This was something I heard over the weekend. I, I nearly fell out of my chair when I heard it. Uh, this is people will use this as an example as to why we should just endlessly shovel money into Ukraine, uh, maybe even through next year's election, just so there can be no doubt that we're fully financially committed to the Ukrainian effort. Versus Russia. I, I don't know how you it feels like the biggest non sequitur ever to to hear that. But that's I, I heard that more than a couple of times this week. And can you speak to that? Yeah, well, you know, Senator Graham has been saying that for a long time. This isn't something that just came up this last week. And this is one of those you almost have to go back to regular order. And, and that's what we've been saying all along. But there needs to be accountability. There needs to be a proper way to if you're going to disperse aid, there needs to be a proper way to do it. You just don't throw it out there and, and you know, have no accountability for it. And you, you, there has to be some, some balance to what we're doing and spending all our taxpayers' money. And that's what I talk about accountability. And I think that when you look at a senator, a U.S. senator, I don't care who it is, it's Lindsey Graham or anybody else, you have to say, look, okay, kind of get your – do a self-check and make sure you understand this is the people's money, Americans' money, what you're doing, and make sure that's accountable. And why are we doing this? You know, you know and everybody now understands this, acknowledges this. What is our game plan? What is the end state on this? What do we see? Now everybody's kind of saying exactly the same thing. It's we've been, I've been saying this for over a year. <clears throat> What's your end state? Has the president addressed the American people? No. Has he told the American people what the end game in Ukraine is? No. Why hasn't he done that? And this is one of those I really believe this administration thinks that if they do something, it's like whistling past the graveyard. All oh, Americans won't care. They're going to forget about it tomorrow. They're an ADD society. No. Somebody needs to pull them in, do a self-check, and say, this is the reason why this is happening. And I'd say the same thing to Lindsey Graham. Look, you need to explain this to the American people. Why did you say that? Why should this be done? You need to tell your constituents in South Carolina why you think this should be done. And they haven't done it at all, Chris. What do you call this? Is this Israel-Hamas war? Is this an Israeli-Palestinian war? Because, you know, it's just interesting in the framing. Some people call it terrorism. Some people call it militants. Some people call it... What, what does Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg call this? Yeah, I call it war on mankind. You know, you know, Chris, let me give you an, an example. Years ago, when I went to... In 2019, I went to Auschwitz with Vice President uh, Mike Pence, and we spent about four hours on the ground there. And I remember going back, and after being at the railhead where they actually, you know, took families off the trains and moved them right to the gas chambers and crematoriums. I remember getting on board the aircraft and I looked at the Vice President. I said, you know, for the first time in my life, Mr. Vice President, I doubt the existence of God. And he looked at me and he said, it wasn't God, it was man. And it was a good self-check, and it was a gut check that basically, look, this is what man does with man and humanity if you let it happen. And this is what I mean by a war on humanity. This is something you cannot, as a, as a human in the moral fiber, you cannot accept. You cannot accept families being murdered like they were, the children being shot, ch children being taken from their families, uh, you know, it, defenseless families just being gunned down or people at a party being gunned down. This is not Hamas on Israel. This is what I mean by war on mankind. It's exactly what we said at the end of World War II. We, the, 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 the powers that won that war, 
never again. You cannot accept this. If you accept this, then you don't have the moral fiber or the moral authority to say anything about anything when it comes to human life. And I think we have to accept it that way. This is just unacceptable barbarism, and we have to treat it like that. It's you know, you, Sometimes you put a mad dog down. That's what you have to do. Sometimes you put this down in the harshest of ways and make sure everybody understands you will not – you as a person, as a nation – as, a, as an organization, you will not accept this. And we should. that's how we should approach it. And so everyone should understand, Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg, that when we start to get reports um, out of uh, Palestinian territories that, you know, there's death, that there's carnage, that there's destruction, we should not be surprised. But, but that will be used. Inevitably, that will be used. Visuals of look at what, look at, look at the horrible things Israel is doing. We're going to start hearing that in short order if we're not already. Oh, okay. Chris, of course you are. Uh, of course we're going to hear that. And we need to tell you, that's when you need to really compartmentalize. You need to say, nope, this is what caused it, and this is the repercussions from it. Remember, Israel hasn't been in Gaza since 2005. Ariel Sharon pulled all of Israelis, in, in fact, settlements. He actually took down 21 Israeli settlements in Gaza brought those people out, some of them forcefully, to make sure we said, this is the, this is the Palestinians, over to them. The fact that they came out to do it, of course they're going to reap the whirlwind when they do that. And we should expect that. And when people say otherwise, you, go, you, you cut back what I believe, Chris, to your moral argument. Your moral argument is this is what Hamas has done. Not the Palestinian people, and you target the Hamas leadership. And that's what I think they need to do, because you don't want to go in and fight in a city. That's, if you're in the military, that's the worst place you want to fight. But you basically tell everybody who's involved in Hamas leadership and Palestinian leadership, okay, you're on target right now. We are coming for you, and when somebody replaces you, we are coming for them, and we're coming for the, the person that replaces them as well. And you make sure that the, the leadership understands that's how it's going to be. That's when we went after Soleimani. That's when we told the supreme leader, if you come after us after we get Soleimani, we're coming after you. And they knew it, and we were dead serious about it. And that's how you have to handle this, because you're not going to find, Chris, every single Hamas fighter. You're just not. But you can find their leadership, and you should make sure they pay the price. That's how you have to handle it. And this is where they start doing really unconscionable things, like they will embed in in, in um, nursing homes and hospitals and child care facilities just to goad Israel into hitting these uh, what appear to be very you know vulnerable people. Uh, that that they often do that, do they not? They they put their worst of their worst amongst their most innocent. Sure they do. I mean, but this is, yeah, I hate to say this, Chris, this is the history of warfare. Yeah. This is what they do. People put the, people put people in hospitals, in mosques, in, in churches, and the way they do it, because they think they're protected. And this is one of those, you have to steal yourself. When you're in a leadership position, and it's hard, Chris, and I'll be the first to tell you it's hard when you make decisions like this, but sometimes you have to say, okay, this is what we're going to have to do. And those are the, those are the hard, hard decisions you make as a leader and, and, and tough leaders make those decisions. You have to understand what you're going to do and the consequences. But that's when I made a comment earlier, Chris, you have to compartmentalize. You have to be so focused in on this, that this is your end state and this is where you're going to go because there'd be so much extraneous stuff coming in, in at you. Oh, you can't do this. You shouldn't do this. Oh, this is bad. Yeah, I got it. But I know where my end state is and this is where I'm going. And this is a true test of leadership. And and I and I'm really proud to say, Chris, I thought we had that in the Trump administration. The the whole team that we had there, especially at the end, was focused like that. And I don't see that in this administration at all. And because of that, you're reaping the whirlwind. Again, I don't mean to be hyperbolic, but I do have to ask: when you see a China that's kind of up against it economically, and they want Taiwan, when you see Russia who's up against it, up against it economically, and they want a little more of Ukraine, you see Iran and what they've always been up to. You can start to draw, I mean, this starts to feel very much like an axis of evil potential here. Is it already a soft axis of evil? And if so, what what should that make us mindful of for the future? Yeah, you know, Chris, I, I don't think it's a soft axis of evil. I think it is a hard one. I think it's you're there, um, whether you like it or not. And what we tried to do in the past is you have to keep them separated. You, you know, instead of fighting them all, you know, it's, think of your, your fist. If you have an open hand, all the fingers are separated. You try to handle each one of those differently. But when you've got a closed fist, you have to treat it a lot differently. And now we're 
fist with his axes because they're also putting and feeding off of one another. That was the reason we we had helped to keep them apart. That's the reason why we we work with no try to work with North Korea and keeping Kim Jong Un out of China's orbit, deep into their orbit. But now that they're together, you're going to have to treat them that way, and it's a much much more dangerous world. This this world is exceptionally fragile, exceptionally dangerous right now because of the lack of leadership. And, and, and I really believe that in this administration. And so what you have to do is you have, now have to look at it in a much different way than we looked at it. Look, when we were working with Israel, the reason, one of the reasons we wanted to do the Abraham Accords was to create economic value for the region. And we told the Palestinians, you can be part of this if you want to. But we're not going to count out to you. They come and join us. And they saw the success of that. They, the, the, the Iranians saw it, the Palestinians saw it, and they were frightened because of it, because we were able to separate them. And that's what you want to do. But right now, Chris, you're right on it, exactly right. And it's not a soft alliance. It's a hard alliance. And we're going to have to understand that. And, and, and we're not. And the reason I say when some people say, well, what do you mean you're not? Look what just happened with Saudi and Iran. Who brokered the deal, the peace deal between them? China, not us. That's in our backyard. That should have never happened. Nine Americans dead at least among the 800, over 800 murdered in Israel. Um, you know, we know there are Americans there in Israel uh, who I assume will be able. I mean, I don't know. We, we just talked to some this morning, friends of ours, the show, um, who were there traveling uh, for tourism. Uh, I, I mean, I, I assume everybody will be able to freely get out of there. Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg, I mean, do you have any sense of that? Or no. well, I think, you know, a lot of the American, I know the American Airlines, a lot of um, the, the carriers, a lot of them are either delaying traffic, canceling traffic. But I just know somebody who's actually lives near me that just came out of there the, the day before. There, there's ways to get out of that. They just have to be super cautious and, and, and go into protected areas. I'd move away from the, 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 the real dangerous areas, which is near, near the Gaza Strip or the northern part of Israel. But the fact is, you know, if, and, and anybody who's ever been to Israel, you realize how small it is mm. and how, you know, the fact is you're, you're vulnerable for attack anywhere. And when you used to, when I mean, when I traveled there, you actually kind of had to realize that, that this is a threat environment just by the lack of the size of the country in, in sheer geographical dimensions. And you just have to accept it. And it's part of the process of accepting the fact that you're there. So just be cautious about it. Um, and, and we'll get our Americans out, and, uh, and I'm not too worried about Americans coming in and out. But they just have to be very, very cautious about it. But don't do anything stupid. Don't say, well, I want to get close to the Gaza Strip and look at it. And uh, nope, you don't want to do that. In fact, the, the, the Israeli military has kind of cordoned off that area anyway. And uh, you know, there's about 21 settlements that they've evacuated right around Gaza right now. So uh, even getting close to that is going to be pretty hard. So I, it, I think you're safe as long as you're cautious about it. I know you can't predict war, but... Do, do, could you project out what this looks like when it's over? I mean, Netanyahu says, you know, we're we're leveling we're, we're leveling it. I mean, this is war, and we're we're going to see this through to the end. So this is this is next level stuff. This is not your typical skirmish that we've covered over the years. Well, I think you know, Chris, it's it's one of those. That's where you have to make the hard call when you're a national security individual. You know, what do you mean? What is your end state, and how do you get there? You know, what you – and I will tell you as a military guy, you what you do not want to do, fighting in cities and in built up areas is, is horrific. It's really, really hard, and your casualty numbers go way up. So the question is, okay, you want to level it, you want to destroy it, or whatever you want to do. So what, it is, what, is you, what is your definition of success? And that's what you'd ask Netanyahu, okay, what do you plan on what, – what do you mean by success? Because the ones you want to eliminate are the terrorist organization. What Hamas? By the way, Hamas was voted in by the Palestinian people there in Gaza. They're the ones who voted Fatah out and and Hamas in. But you want to go after the leadership and the senior leaders, and I, and I would really stay focused in on that. And I and I hate to say this that the the, the, the people that they've taken, Hamas has taken as hostages. I Chris, it's a hard thing to say, but you almost have to write them off. The fact is, you probably will not see them again, especially the military officers that they've taken. I don't. I, the chance of seeing them is 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 virtually zero, yeah. and you have to respond accordingly, and you have to be hard about it, and not worry about the extraneous noise coming in on you. Be very determined what you want to do, and be very very focused on Hamas and damaging uh, their infrastructure, or destroying their infrastructure and their leadership as well. Do you, do you imagine there being additional military 
movement from other nations, not not necessarily us, but Iran formally moving in or or others? I see, Chris, but I see potential Hezbollah from the north. That's the problem. And Hezbollah's got a lot of, you know, rockets and military forces. You know, the Israelis fought them before, and that is a tough area to fight in as well. So and Israel's never wanted to fight a two-front war. They've done it. But, you know, you never want to do it. But that's the, that is going to depend on the response. You, that's the reason I said earlier, you make it very, very clear to them what the response is going to be. And that's when they say, you know, we, you want to make them say, you know, we're going to sit this one out. Thank you very much. But if they come in, then they get into, is the potential there and the possibility there? Sure it is, especially if they show weakness, and especially if the West shows weakness. And this is the reason why the United States of America should tell Iran, who's the sponsor, we support Israel to the hilt. And if you do something stupid, this is destabilizing, and you will be held accountable. And we have to bring the rest of the world in with us on this, because this is actually horrific. This was this goes back to what I said that happened at, at the end of World War II when we said never again. Well, this is one of those never again moments. You're not going. We cannot tolerate this as a Western nation. It just cannot be done. Look, remember when 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 uh, Assad used sarin nerve gas on the civilians, and Obama said that was a red line. We would recross that if they crossed it, we'd come after them, and they never did anything. We did, and we said to him clearly: when you use sarin nerve gas, which was developed by the Nazis, and the Nazis never even used it because it's all horrific. You've crossed a moral line, and we went after them. And that's when you have to tell the rest of the world, there is a line that has now been crossed. And if you cross it, we're going to be with the rest of the world and we're coming after you. And you have to be very determined about it. And they have to believe that you're going to do something like that because you cannot let this kind of thing continue or it's just going to spiral truly out of control. Yeah. Hezbollah lob- <clears throat> lobbing some uh, rockets, it sounds like, from the north in today. Um, at least that's what the reports sound. I, I also read something that suggested that Russia may be Again, these are things I read on X. So, I mean, Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg, how much you can trust this stuff, I don't know. But uh, that, that maybe even um, munitions being sent in to give the appearance of Ukraine uh, aiding, you know, trying to kind of, uh, I don't know, frame Ukraine or something. I mean, you can get a lot of bad guys doing things, uh, head fakes and whatnot in situations like this, I guess. It's possible. I don't know how true any of that is, but... Um, Bad guys looking to take advantage of the situation is is obvious, I would guess. Yeah, it is, Chris, and you, that's well put. Bad guys taking you know advantage of the situation, and and I don't. I think Russia's got enough problems; they're not going to be involved. But they're probably clapping their hands, yeah, and 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 you know raising a toast to what's happening because why? Because it distracts us, because it pushes us and it forces us in another direction. This is the cla- This is why I said earlier what you need to do is you need to compartmentalize, you need to treat each one individually, and you have to be very, very hard about it. Because if you don't, then you're going to you're going to, you're going to reap the whirlwind. And that's what we're doing right now. And the Russians are very, very happy about what's happening, obviously, because it distracts us from what's happening in, the, in their neck of the woods. Mm-hmm. And you have to be able to you know, basically walk and chew bubblegum at the same time. And, and we, you're able to do that as long as you keep your head in the game and, very, and very, have a really good national security team around you that can handle this, juggle all of these balls, that's what I used to say in, when in the White House. There's never an easy decision. They're all hard, and you have to be very balanced in how you approach them. I wish you were there now, Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg. We're grateful to lean on you today, my friend. Thank you so much, sir, for your all your time and analysis and excellence today. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Telephone number 610-850-0990. Um, great work today, by the way, Fast Eddie. We, um, we cobbled together the best show and presentation we could do to kind of unpack and sort through all this stuff today for you. It's a lot. It's a heavy lift. For those of us that are not students of world affairs and international diplomacy, this is, uh, this is a lot to try to swallow and digest, but it's deadly serious. And um, so we, in our small way, hope we've done our, our best to, to give you the, the most up-to-date information that we can. The Chris DeGall Show Podcast.